Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to our chief guest of the evening, Shri Sham Saran and Mr. M.K. Raskotra. Jehan, good evening and welcome. On behalf of the Center for Air Power Studies, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to one of our annual flagship events, the Jasjeet Singh Memorial Lecture, held in memory of our founder director general, Air Commodore Jasjeet Singh. May I now invite Air Marshal Anil Chopra, PVSM, AVSM, VM, VSM, Director General of the Center for Air Power Studies to deliver the welcome remarks. Chief of Air Staff, AC Marshal B.R. Chaudhary, uh, guest of honor for the day, Mr. Shams Sundar, Shams Saran, uh, former Foreign Secretary and Chairman of the uh, Trust that governs the CAPS, uh, serving and retired uh, military and civilian officers, members uh, of the Diplomatic Corps, members of media, authors of uh, the chapters uh, that are there in the book that's going to be released later uh, as we go along and uh, most importantly, the members of the family of Air Commodore Jajit Singh who are seated here on my right. Uh, good evening and welcome to this fifth Air Commodore Jajit Singh Memorial Lecture. The, uh, and uh, my apologies for the rains. Uh, many have made it, the hall is gradually filling up and many others have called me to say that they will be here in a short while. So we will get to have more people by the time Mr. Shamsaran gets to speak. As we all uh, are aware, Air Commodore Jajit Singh uh, was the founder, director general of Center for Air Power Studies, a think tank which he himself started in 2001. And uh, ever since CAPS has grown into a credible institution with, uh, when it comes to matters related to air power and aerospace uh, security, nuclear strategy and neighborhood studies. And from, uh, especially in our uh, troubled neighborhood uh, it was uh, the vision of uh, Ekumdo Jajit Singh uh, to build intellectual capital uh, of the country and imbue uh, with the national security consciousness. And he made uh, sure that CAPS engaged in this uh, uh, mission through conduct of in-depth research and uh, carry out uh, various uh, seminars and events to disseminate uh, this knowledge to everybody else. We also have a large number of publications. I am uh, very proud to say that we have published over 250 books and uh, journals uh, ever since CAPS has been formed. And after his demise uh, in uh, 2013, at the age of 79, we began uh, having this uh, uh, to commemorate his uh, work. Uh, and in his memory, we started this uh, Jai Singh Memorial Lecture. And this is the fifth uh, in the series. A Commodore Jesse Singh was uh, born on 8th July 1934 uh, and he served as a fighter pilot uh, from 1956 to 1988 and uh, he took part in both 65 and 71 war and in 71 war as a squadron leader, uh, as a strike pilot, he struck many Pakistani posts, well defended ones uh, and knocked off many tanks and bunkers and for this he was awarded the Veer Chakra. He later on uh, commanded 17 squadron uh, uh, on MiG-21 uh, at Halwara. Uh, I happen to have been lucky to be in the sister squadron, had occasions to uh, fly with him in formation and uh, interact with him professionally and uh, uh, socially. And uh, uh, I have some very, very fond memories. Uh, <coughs> He uh, subsequently, for his uh, work in um, uh, the squadron, he was awarded the uh, YOCNA medal and uh, subsequently in air headquarters as uh, uh, director aircraft uh, induction 
uh, he was awarded the Ati Vasheth Seva Medal. Rajit Singh was a passionate uh, advocate of uh, national security, and after his retirement uh, in uh, 1984, uh, he uh, started, uh, uh, he, he joined uh, Institute of Defense Studies in Malisit, and uh, subsequently was the longest survey uh, director general from 1987 to 2001 of IDSA. Uh, uh, he thereafter founded the uh, Center for Air Power Studies in 2001. Uh, post that, uh, as a director general for next uh, 12 years, uh, he wrote uh, uh, many books covering uh, air power, nuclear, national strategy, uh, Asian security, Asia-Pacific, uh, in India-Pakistan issues, and essays on China, Indo, uh, Indian Ocean, Kargil, and uh, on joint operations, technology, military leadership, energy security, and defense spending, among many, many other subjects. Clearly, a very vast canvas, and he's the one who also wrote the, uh, uh, the, the book, The Icon, uh, biography of uh, Marshal of the Indian Air Force, uh, uh, Arjun Singh, DFC. Uh, at the National Security Advisory Board, under the mentorship of K. Subramaniam, uh, Jaji Singh made important contributions to uh, national security and the draft nuclear doctrine for India. He was uh, highly regarded internationally, and uh, he was uh, highly regarded uh, for his work, and uh, he was awarded Padma Bhushan in 2006 for his contribution to strategic thought. I think we all need to put our hands together for Ekamla Ek Jajit Singh and the family. <laughs> Shri Shamsaran, our uh, Padma Bhushan, a guest of honor for the day, who's a speaker, will, is well known among the diplomatic and strategic uh, community. Born in 1946, he joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1970 and rose to become the Foreign Secretary. He served the Indian diplomatic uh, missions in Beijing, Tokyo, and Geneva, and as a Joint Secretary in Prime Minister's Office in 1991-92, he looked after uh, foreign affairs, nuclear, and uh, defense-related issues. Uh, he was India's ambassador to Myanmar, Indonesia, Nepal, and High Commissioner in Mauritius. He retired as the Foreign Secretary in 2006 and was appointed Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Indo-US civil nuclear issues and later as Special Envoy and Chief Negotiator on Climate Change. In April 2006, he said that India had no obligation to define its minimum credible nuclear deterrence after the United States Assistant Secretary of State Richard Boshe suggested that India must further define its minimum nuclear deterrence. Later in 2012, he wrote a research article in which he pointed out that Pakistan's nuclear arsenal's expansion has been extended this time not to deter India, but to deter possible American attack on Pakistan. So the two very interesting uh, observations. He headed the research and information system for developing countries, a prestigious think tank uh, focusing on economic issues from 2011 to 2017. From 2013 to 2015, he was the chairman of the National Security Advisory Board under the National Security uh, Council. He regularly comments and speaks on uh, political and foreign uh, policy issues. He's uh, contributed to many magazines and newspapers. He is uh, cr currently the president of India International Center. A member of the governing uh, board of Institute of Chinese Studies and trustee at the World Wildlife Fund India. He is also the member of Executive Council of the Federation of Chamber of Commerce and Industry, FICI. Uh, in May 2019, he was conferred the Spring Order Gold and Silver Star by the Emperor of Japan for promoting India-Japan relations. Among his books is How India Sees the World, Cotillia to the 21st Century, which he published in 2017, and more recently, just uh, Two months back, he published his second book, How China Sees India and the World. It has just been released uh, two months back. He is uh, fluent at uh, Chinese and can converse in French. And of course, uh, of today's talk is in English, that I can assure you. He will be um, s speaking on why India needs a national security strategy. His uh, talk will be followed by a Q&A session and uh, after which uh, we will be requesting the Air Chief to uh, release a CAPS book uh, of the aerospace vertical, 
uh, titled Air Power and Emerging Technologies, uh, which has been uh, edited by the vertical head uh, AVM Anil Gulani and group captain uh, Rana. Before I invite uh, Mr. Shamsaran, I am uh, going to request uh, Mr. Rasgotra, whom Mr. Shamsaran just called as his guru, to say a few words first. Over to Mr. Rasgotra. Sir, you can sit there and speak. If you wish to come here, you are most welcome. Yes. Respected uh, Chief of the Air Staff, other senior officers of the Indian military, Mr. Sham Taran, uh, my, I'm going to say, a revered colleague. Uh, <coughs> it is, uh, I think, appropriate that uh, we celebrate the memory of just these things by this lecture once every year. He was uh, one of the two great thinkers on military matters for several years, uh, from the 60s to the 90s, uh, to the late 80s. And uh, I remember him, I had no special qualifications for this, but uh, when he retired and I was on the verge of retirement, he caught me up uh, uh, and uh, we started discussing uh, the military affairs of our country. His genius was slightly more expanded than the other great thinker of the time, Subramaniam. He has written much more. I think he also traveled more extensively. And, uh, but both of them have made enormous contribution to what has come to be known uh, strategy. To confess to you, sir, I still do not know what this word means. Uh, and I, I am very, I'm looking forward really to hear your views on the subject. Uh, there are scattered uh, pearls about strategy. For example, uh, we hear statements occasionally from a variety of people including uh, the Honorable uh, the Raksha Mantri, that we are ready to fight and win a two war, two front war. Well, that is strategy, or behind it there is a strategy, a great deal of thinking. But there is a good deal of uh, misunderstanding of what the security study means. Some of this mis uh, misunderstanding has been spread by uh, foreigners. We, I was uh, with the Subramaniam, Jasjit Singh, and some others, a member of the first National Security Advisory Board, and we were given the task of uh, defining a nuclear doctrine for the country. We worked very hard for days. And eventually, I think uh, just three of us sat down and uh, wrote uh, what we thought was the proper, uh, comprehensive nuclear security doctrine for our country. There were great uh, uh, skepticism about it, not in India. I think that actually the, the original doctrine created quite an impression here on our government and other thoughtful thinking circles. But skepticism abroad 
we Indians don't have uh, the proper nuclear establishment, and here they are writing a nuclear doctrine and uh, proclaiming that uh, no first use and uh, 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 minimum necessary uh, wherewithal of nuclear protection. Only yesterday I was reading that a good American friend who has been, ha, had, had been posted here in our country and generally very friendly, he has raised, the doubts raised were about no first use. Where will that take India in an actual war? He has now raised another doubt. He says uh, the Indian capacity to deter China is eroding steadily thanks to the problems with India's minimum deterrence. The words exist in the doctrine, minimum deterrence. But uh, this gentleman seems to think that uh, minimum is an e eternal quantity. When we wrote the doctrine, China had uh, a certain amount of nuclear weapon, the wherewithal of making, expanding, and so on and so forth. Ours was limited, <coughs> but we felt at that time that even 100 weapons would be adequate. But as China has expanded, I the people like this who should be better informed think that uh, India has stayed with its original 20, 30, 50, or 100 weapon systems. I have no doubt in my mind that uh, the quantum of minimum requirements of uh, nuclear defense in India has expanded with time and with our own expanding capacity, manufacturing and so on and so forth. Mr. Sham Saran played a very vital role in um, uh, making a deal with the United States of America. It's called nuclear energy deal, but it's also a deal for a certain permission granted to uh, set aside uh, nuclear material for weapon systems, etc. So I don't want to go in further details. Uh, uh, strategic thinking uh, in our country is the monopoly, I think, uh, generally of think tanks. The think tank you had, sir, or the military think tank and the Navy think tank, they, I know, are doing very serious thinking about it because they know the subject also. But a lot of NGOs here, sir, in our country, who have no acquaintance with military requirements or the nature of the war uh, in which requirements change, doctrines change. Uh, they are dishing out material on, new, on strategic security. And frankly, uh, this has confused my own mind about <laughs> what it means. So, sir, uh, we are looking forward today. I think the subject we have set you Sounds very simple. Why India needs a national security strategy? I think the answer is very simple. Everybody knows it. We have two mortal enemies. <laughs> China to our north, uh, we are involved in a strategy, uh, military struggle with it at the moment. And Pakistan, which keeps threatening us that, you know, they will destroy India right up to Calcutta, Assam, boasting about their uh, uh, strategic capability. Incidentally, uh, when uh, Pakistan, the, cr the creator of Pakistan's uh, nuclear uh, weapon, used to brag we can destroy India from end to end. Musharraf happened to be the president of Pakistan. He had invited me to Pakistan. I went and met him. I asked him, sir, your man, does he really know 
what kind of destruction one nuclear bomb caused in Japan. He said, I'm not sure he knows. So I said, why don't you stop him? He said, I'm going to do it. And he, he did stop him after that. We are a more serious country. We have more serious problems. We should talk about this, think about it in a more comprehensive term. The answer I gave is a very simple answer. But there are complications in dealing with both. Uh, India is doing certain things, I think. Whether they weave into a national security strategy, sir, I hope you will enlighten us. I hope if you feel really that we don't have enough, uh, 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 we don't have a sufficient uh, uh, strategy thinking, then what we should do about it. I will say no more, and uh, I thank you for asking me to chair this. You know, I am now too far gone in life, age, for these things. And I hope you will not keep summoning me all the time about these things. Uh, you should have chaired this session yourself, or an uh, air chief could have been requested to session it. But uh, I am very happy <coughs> that you have been requested to talk because I think you are today the lead thinker in this country on what to do with China, how to deal with China. I suggest to all of you, uh, he has recently published a book on how China looks on the world and India, okay? Sir, I started second reading of your book. I found it so interesting, so enlightening, so educating. I think everybody who is dealing with national security study, India's defenses, should, should read this book and try and absorb some of the lessons. I hope you will talk about this also, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I now invite our chief guest, Sri Sham Saran, to enlighten us on why India needs a national security strategy. Chief of uh, Air Staff, Air Marshal V. R. Choudhury, my peer and mentor, Ambassador M. K. Rasgotra, Chairman of this session, Director of the Center for Air Power Studies, Air Marshal Anil Chopra, Air Vice Marshal Anil Gulani, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, deeply honored to have been invited to deliver the Air Commodore Jasjeet Singh Memorial Lecture this evening. Air Commodore Jasji Singh was not only the founder of the Center for Power Studies, but had for several years served as the director of IDSA. He earned the well-deserved reputation of being one of India's foremost strategic thinkers. I had the privilege of enjoying a close association with him during the course of my diplomatic career. I always benefited from my several interactions with him. His deep familiarity with national security issues, his commitment to promoting a more informed debate on such issues, and his always calm and sober articulation of views won him many admirers. I salute his memory and count it as a privilege to have been invited to deliver a lecture in his memory. I have chosen as a subject for my lecture today, one which was close to Jasjee Singh's heart, that is national security. It is also appropriate to debate this critical issue at a time when we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of India's independence, looking back on our journey so far, and also charting the road ahead. National security of a modern state seeks to safeguard its territorial integrity and national sovereignty 
and promote the economic and social development and overall welfare of its people through seeking to create and to sustain an enabling and supportive internal and external environment. In this broader conception, national security relates to the overall capacity of a state to pursue national interest in its comprehensive and contemporary domains. The strategy which a state adopts for the pursuit of this key objective constitutes its national security strategy. Strategy involves making informed choices among a range of possible alternatives. It should come as no surprise that such choices will be influenced by a country's history, its civilizational and cultural attributes, its geographical location, and the nature of its polity. It will reflect the country's worldview, the aspirations of its people, and the nature of its political dispensation. The nature of its relationship with other states, in particular those in its neighborhood, and with major powers, both near and distant, will be important factors. These together form a broad template, an overall perspective on the basis of which decisions may be taken on specific day-to-day -day and topical issues. A national security strategy in its most efficient articulation should provide a broad and ready guide, a stable and predictable benchmark against which the various organs and agencies of the state take decisions on a whole range of issues they confront in exercising governance. A national security strategy imparts coherence to governance, permits a whole of government approach, which is indispensable in an increasingly complex, cross-sectoral and cross-disciplinary reality a modern state confronts. Often in government, the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing. Uh, to just illustrate this point, I would like to uh, just relate an anecdote from my time uh, in 1991, I was Joint Secretary in the Prime Minister's office, and I was looking after defense, uh, atomic energy, and external affairs. At that time, the Prime Minister, Dr. Narasimha Rao, Mr. Narasimha Rao, called me. There was a crisis because the Indian Space Department uh, was denied uh, a particular technology that it had been had, had access to for several years. They used to make guidance uh, chips for space vehicles. But they used to send it to Fuji company in Japan for radiation hardening of those chips. Because you know, when the re-entry takes place, there is very intense heat and radiation which is uh, radiated. And uh, this can even melt uh, you know, the equipment. Uh, so this uh, guidance chip being radiation hardened was very important. So Dr. U.R. Rao was the space secretary at that time. And he said that all our programs have come to a standstill because we no longer have access to this uh, hardening because the US has told Japan that this would violate what was known as the missile technology control regime. So the Japanese had said they cannot uh, supply this anymore. So I was asked to uh, explore whether there were other countries from which we could get this. Uh, we tried very hard. All of them had been, of course, told by the U.S. not to supply this te technology to India. Uh, so there seemed to be no solution. It just so happened that while I was looking at this, uh, Dr. P.K. Ayanga, who was the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, he came to see me about some project. And while he was sitting with me, it suddenly struck me you know, if we are talking about radiation, this man sitting in front of me deals with radiation. Uh, so maybe he can advise me. So I mentioned to him that this is the problem which we are facing. Uh, we can't do this radiation hardening. Is there something that you can do to help us? And he laughed and he said, but radiation is our business. What is so difficult about this? So I said, if this guidance chip is sent to you, can you radiation harden it? He said, that's one of the simplest things that we can do. <laughs> so, uh, you know, something which uh, was really, really sitting right next to you uh, in the country, 
you did not have to actually have that technology from abroad because, as I said, the left hand did not know what the right hand was doing and the matter was resolved. <laughs> While it is primarily a guide for the state and its organs, a well-crafted national security strategy should endeavor, be, endeavor to be a guide for society as well. Indeed, many challenges that we confront today demand a whole of society approach. One may go further and argue that a national security strategy should take cognizance of global challenges such as climate change, pandemics such as the coronavirus epidemic which is still amongst us, and newer domains such as you know, cyber security. These will require a strategy to actively shape these global regimes so that they are aligned with India's interests, but also in a larger sense reflect India's commitment uh, to humanity as a whole. We are as much global citizens today as we are citizens of India, and the line between what is domestic and what is external has become increasingly blurred. A national security strategy must identify the interrelated nature of the challenges which a modern state must deal with and the feedback loops which bind them together. Lack of awareness of such feedback loops often leads to interventions in one domain which may cancel out interventions in another domain. There could conceivably be interventions in one domain which may actually reinforce the impact of interventions in another domain and therefore be more desirable. To give you an example, food security involves the raising of crop yields for which significant applications of chemical fertilizers, toxic pesticides uh, are necessary and also very large volumes of water. And this is at least in terms of the current strategy which we follow. However, the increasing use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides by farmers, often without any protective gear, has led to health crisis in many parts of rural India. Farmers and their family members, exposed daily to very high levels of toxicity, have a very high incidence also of skin, eye, respiratory diseases, and are often bankrupted, not by crop failure, but by unaffordable hospitalization and medical treatment costs. These costs do not figure in the economics of agricultural production. Furthermore, in most parts of our country, there is mounting water insecurity because of the massive use of fresh water for intensive agriculture. Agriculture uses something like 70% of our fresh water supplies. In many areas, there is acute water contamination as toxic uh, you know, chemicals find their way into water channels. This is both a health challenge as well as a water challenge. Unless government interventions are aware of these feedback loops, and, and formulate collaborative responses among different organs and agencies of government, such contradictory approaches are inevitable. Only a national security strategy covering multiple domains can avoid such counterproductive policies. The current nature of policy making and implementation is inherent in the siloed nature of governance. Governance needs to permit horizontal and collaborative functioning rather than through the traditional vertical structures we have inherited from the colonial past. Thus, national security strategy may need to address the institutional underpinnings required by a new philosophy of governance. It must also enable the communication of the strategy and its rationale to citizens on whose behalf the state exists and acts. It must enable constant feedback and timely revision whenever required. A strategy which is unable to mobilize a broad political and social consensus is unlikely to succeed, particularly in a democracy. To sum up, a modern state, indeed a modern society, must govern a nation which is inherently complex, plural, and in the midst of dynamic change. There are few familiar anchors and the pace of change is unprecedented today. There are far too many moving parts and no state entity, no leadership could hope to deal with this complexity through ad hoc decision making and reactive interventions. India is an even more complex country with a range and scale of challenges which virtually no other state has to deal with. 
a well thought out national security strategy which at least provides a roadmap to the future we want for ourselves as a nation is therefore an urgent necessity every major country publishes its own national security strategy or sometimes they call it you know national security doctrine you have the us you have uk china uh, which have to release such documents at regular intervals uh, earlier this year so has pakistan actually india is one of the few major powers which has so far avoided undertaking a formal exercise to formulate and then to make public its national security strategy one is often told that the the government does have a broad national security road map but it is not necessary to make it public it is even argued that rele releasing such a document may even alert our adversaries uh, to our security vulnerabilities and our planning for the future uh, better to keep them in the dark the problem is that we have ended up by keeping our own people in the dark who have little idea of what our significant security challenges may be and how the indian state intends to tackle them not having a national security strategy also means that it is difficult to hold the state accountable for its acts of omission and commission nor is it possible to determine what works and what does not since there is no institutionalized evaluation and review there may be planning and review in specific agencies or specific subjects but how these disparate policies and actions add up together how they are interlinked and what gaps need to be filled these critical elements are missing among our armed forces yes for example the army the air force and the navy may have their own perspective plans and implementation strategies but at national level they need to harmonize with one another take advantage of the synergies which exist and coordinate which each may be doing within the larger perspective of military security a cds is only a partial though necessary solution today each domain is pervaded by cyberspace electromagnetic space space based assets have become integral to the use of land based sea based and air based assets both military as well as non military these include communication they also include precision location and navigation these may amplify capabilities they may also use, be used to degrade capabilities it is only within a larger frame of comprehensive national security that these newer dimensions can be incorporated in a manner that enhances a nation's defense and deters its adversary ad hoc and fragmented responses will simply not be adequate to deal with the scale and complexity of these newer challenges which are also mutating even as we try and tackle them a number of efforts have been made in the past to formulate a national security strategy for india the latest such initiative as far as i am aware was undertaken by the national security advisory board in the period 2013 to 15 uh, when i was chair chairing uh, the uh, board after deliberations which lasted over a year and a half a national security strategy was prepared under the title quote building comprehensive national power towards an integrated national security strategy this was the name of the document it was a document of only about 12250 words not a very long document and it was anchored among among five interrelated domains these were a domestic dimension which included national integration internal security border management building intelligence capabilities both internal as well as external including at the level of the states safeguarding of critical infrastructure including cyber and space based assets then there was a military dimension which we looked at included military capabilities and force levels uh, border infrastructure you know something that i was also involved with uh, maritime security uh, defense technologies manufacturing capabilities and very importantly civil and military relations nuclear security and deterrence which uh, ambassador rasbotra sp uh, spoke about uh, for example building up of a triad of nuclear deterrence capabilities a secure command and control system were part of this dimension external dimension the third dimension included india's external relations in particular its subcontinental periphery its extended western eastern and central asian neighborhoods 
its relations with major powers, including the US, China, and Europe, its role in multilateral and regional institutions, and in the setting up of norms in both existing as well as emerging domains. Economic dimension, most important, which included the challenge of sustaining accelerated and inclusive economic growth, building infrastructure, achieving resource security, promoting strategic technologies and manufacturing capabilities, and enhancing global competitiveness of the Indian economy. The criticality of the economic dimension was recognized since the ability to deliver on all other dimensions of national security would be dependent on a larger, expanding, and more diversified economic foundation. Ecological dimension, that was brought in as an additional dimension, including but not limited to tackling climate change and environmental de degradation. Neglect of ecological sustainability risks reaching a dead end in our development process. We considered another important sixth last dimension, which was to be integrated with all the other interrelated domains, and that is strategic communications. As pointed out earlier in a democracy, it is important to communicate the overall national security strategy, its component elements, and their rationale in terms of promoting the welfare of the people to the citizenry to shape public perceptions through constant and consistent outreach and provide a channel for feedback of public opinion. Since the writing of that document seven years ago, the strategic communications field has become actually even more complex. Advances in social media are providing a very powerful instrument for outreach and, 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 and advantage, uh, but has also spawned negative features such as the spread of fake news, disinformation. The need for the state to provide authentic and credible information in a timely manner has become an urgent and often controversial issue. The state has often been unable to resist the temptation of indulging in competitive manipulation of information, and this can only undermine national security in the long run. Credibility of the state is an indispensable element in upholding national security. The National Security Advisory Board set up a number of uh, subgroups, explore each domain in detail, but always bringing back the results of the respective deliberations uh, to the plenary. It is here that we identified some of the contradictions in the proposed interventions and set about reconciling them in a set of coordinated and collaborative recommendations. The overriding objective was to achieve policy coherence across domains. We began to see how vulnerabilities in one domain may exacerbate those in other domains. Equally, there were occasions when we found that increased capabilities sought in one domain parallelly reinforced strengths in other domains. This changes the whole economics of a whole series of interventions. Uh, states are increasingly confronted with various kinds of unexpected emergencies affecting the security and welfare of their citizens. These may occur within the country or in a foreign country. In liberal democracies such as India, there is the added challenge of intense media exposure, which often complicates the handling of crisis situations. It is therefore prudent to have in place institutional mechanisms such as a crisis management group that can respond promptly and efficiently to crises and stay engaged until the event is over. Such mechanisms need very well rehearsed drills, which can be put in motion without delay with designated officials and agency pre-assigned their respective responsibilities. Additional officials agency may be brought in as when, when need arises. Having such mechanisms in place also ensures constant review, evaluation, and learning. The absence of such mechanisms or bypassing them when crisis situations actually arise may severely affect their appropriate handling. A well-crafted national security strategy could provide a template for, again, a whole-of-government approach, which is what modern crises demand as a fundamental prerequisite. This has so far been missing in India, leading to pervasive ad hocism. Every time a crisis occurs, we start de novo dealing with it. National security strategy, by its very nature, has a long-term perspective. 
However, it needs to put in place a crisis management strategy, including institutional processes to enable its implementation. The National Security uh, Advisory Board found it easier to debate different domains of competitive national security, but struggled to find an overarching framework which would bind these disparate threats in a coherent narrative. A national security strategy could not be delinked from the nature of our society at present, the vision of what we as a people wanted to become as a nation and as a society, maybe two or three decades in the future. What would be the instruments needed to accomplish our aspirations? There had to be a broad political consensus over this vision of the future. After considerable and vigorous debate, we came to the conclusion that we should take the Constitution of India as the guiding star to our work, since it is a document which still commands universal respect and enjoys, for now, consensus across the political spectrum. To give you a flavor of how we went about applying the intent of the Constitution to our work, I would like to refer to the section relating to domestic security, which pointed out that uh, you know, the Indian Constitution has a very citizen-centric foundation. Uh, it, this implied that the national security strategy uh, designed to identify, confront, and overcome threats to national security and to the security and well-being of uh, citizens uh, should be taken as, the, as the, really the guiding star. It noted that national unity was being undermined through the assertion of multiple but increasingly narrow identities, the rise of sectarian and communal tendencies, often instigated and encouraged by political calculations, and the sharpening of social tensions due to lack of economic and employment opportunities and growing inequality. It concluded that while a national security strategy cannot deliver national unity, it is only the assurance of national unity which could enable a credible national security strategy. India's diversity and the plurality of its society are a source of strength, but only if they are transcended in a larger identity of shared citizenship, which the Constitution stipulates. Having been associated with national security and foreign policy issues during my career as a civil servant, my experience confirms the urgent necessity of formulating a national security strategy for India, comprehensive in scope, but flexible in its implementation. Ad hoc decision making is a luxury we can no longer afford. We have had limitations of what, we have had intimations of what perils await us in the absence of such a well honed strategy. The building blocks of such a national security strategy already exist, and there is enough talent and experience in this country to deliver a document that may guide national security decisions in an increasingly complex and unpredictable world. It should be a document that is open to public debate, to crowdsourcing the wisdom of the people of India and making it a truly participative exercise. Thank you for your attention. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure that all of you would probably go back uh, today enlightened by the provocative talk given by uh, Sri Shamsaran. Uh, while I cannot thank him enough on behalf of uh, CAPS for taking time out and speaking to us uh, this evening, what I would like to reiterate is the fact that it is incumbent upon all of us, especially the think tanks, to take this forward and give practical and implementable policy inputs to the government, as he mentioned. Uh, the trajectory of any organization or a nation is dependent largely upon 
the role that its leadership plays. And the hands of the leadership needs to be strengthened by focused research papers and analysis by think tanks on national security and other issues which impact the security of the nation. And we need to segue them all together to make a comprehensive national security policy. I think Air Commodore Jasjeet Singh had the vision to establish uh, CAPS. And we endeavor to live up to his expectations even as we have large shoes to fill. Uh, CAPS has made an effort to widen its reach through the social media by being present on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And the articles on our website, which, have been re which has recently been revamped, uh, give readers regular inputs and updates on aerospace, regional, nuclear, and Indo-Pacific issues. We have also started monthly newsletters from all our four vertical, verticals, which gives a bird's eye view of important developments in their respective domains. And we would like you all to visit our website and follow us on social media, and also give us inputs and suggestions for improvements, which I can assure you that we will consider and incorporate. I would like to thank the Chief, Air Chief Marshal Chaudhary, the Chief of Air Staff, for gracing this uh, flagship event of CAPS in the memory of Air Commodore Jasjeet Singh, and to Sri Sam Shamsaran for accepting our request and giving a thought-provoking talk on the urgent need for India to have a national security strategy. I would also like to thank uh, Group Captain Anand Rao and his team for coordinating this event and making it a great success. And in the end, may I request you all to put your hands together for A. Komodo Jasjeet Singh, Sham Saran, Sri Ras Gotra, and Team Caps India for this event. Thank you, and Jai Hind. May I now request DG Caps Air Marshal Anil Chopra to please present a token of appreciation to our chief guest, Sri Sham Saran. May I please invite Air Chief Marshal V.R. Chaudhary, PVSM, AVSM, VM, ADC to the stage for the book release. We will now proceed to launch the latest book from the Aerospace Vertical at CAPS titled Air Power and Emerging Technologies. A timely addition to the literature on air power, th this book provides an overview of futuristic and emerging technologies in the aerospace domain and their likely impact on future conflicts. May I please invite the editors of the book, Air Vice Marshal Anil Golani and Group Captain Vijay Shankar Rana and the Managing Director of KW Publishers, Ms. Kalpna Shukla, to come on stage. May I also ask the dignitaries on stage to kindly step forward for the book release. I request Air Chief Marshal V.R. Chaudhary to kindly do the honors and release the book. I now request all the contributors of the book to kindly join on stage for a group photograph. Please welcome them with a warm round of applause.
Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. May I please request everyone to move to the foyer for high tea and refreshments. Thank you.